I'm wearing many hats today. I started out my day giving a tour of the library. Then I'm now working with the book festival, and who knows where else I may end up. But when I was asked if I, I said, I'm planning to attend this session. My name is Barbara Thoreau, and I had a former life as a bookseller. And now I have a life as a volunteer, working all the places I really appreciate and love in our town of Missoula. So I'm here to introduce our two readers, because I know Ray well, and I, I have always known of Dorothy. So this is, this is what we're celebrating. Copies of this are available out there at the Fact and Fiction book table. And she'll stand and she'll talk and tell us more about it. But every, I, I was led to believe, not led to believe, Ray told me that every time Dorothy is going somewhere, Ray has to come with her. <laughs> because Ray helped and edited and worked with Dorothy hand in hand on putting this collection together and now going across the state and promoting things. So from the official book, uh, book festival, bio, Dorothy Bradley believes there are three fundamental things in life. What you do, where you do it, and who you do it with. Thus, her drive to safeguard the planet, her continuous centering herself in Montana, and her veneration of world of friends. Dorothy had a storied life as a Montana state representative and a gubernatorial candidate. And then, I love this note. Seriously, look up her Wikipedia page. <laughs> she will likely want to direct the event toward other parts of her life, though, and may ask her editor, Ray Olson, to read. So I was told they are both planning to read. And we hope all the mics work for the whole session. And I'm sure afterwards there will be some time for Q&A. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, Dorothy. Hear all this chuckling out there. How fun! How fun can this be? I'm I'm absolutely charmed. Thank you for being here. I give huge thanks to the all the people of the book festival for putting this on. I mean, what an opportunity for someone like me. I never imagined or even dreamed of being in a position like this. So. I'm just going to love every minute of it. Um, I have not been a writer in my life. I think mostly what I have written are things like guest columns and newspapers that are limited at 700 words. And then I got going on some little stories about my pets because I love them so much. And then I got a little more adventuresome and did stories about my partner, Dan, and some of his wild ranch adventures. And then I finally sat down a couple of years ago and thought, okay, I've got a couple of things I need to write down that are my own stories. So I need to do that. I made my list, and I started writing them, and then I sent a couple of them to my friend Ray. This book would not exist except for Ray. I was going to do something short and sweet and maybe run it through Instaprint like I did the others and get a few copies for my family. And she looked at that and she said, this is fun. This is kind of fun. We should think about publishing it. And so we did. And there's a lot of things I want to say about that. That has been fun. It was fun because of my partner, Ray. She uh, is the kind of editor who not only really knows how to write, but is also a very generous editor. She knows how I think, and she can come up with ideas that are beautiful, but they didn't just totally squelch my sentiments. And when we actually had this thing out in print, she sent it around to a number of her friends and said, this might be the funnest story you'll read this summer, but for sure it is the shortest. <laughs> so this is the, probably the shortest. It's 69 pages. 
And what I would like it to do is to motivate all of you to sit down and think of a few of your own. Uh, we have said we've started a new genre. We call it tiny books. And uh, I've already had one cousin sit down and write a whole bunch of chapters about his youth in Scotland. I mean, you have something important to say. And I guarantee you, when you write it down and get it out there, there will be others who absolutely love it. And even if they didn't, you will love it, which is part of the point. I was really glad to get this all off of my own shoulders and into print, and it's been an absolute marvelous uh, time for getting it out and sharing it. So I hope you'll do the same. Tiny books. So I'm going to read you. I had all these little chapters in my head. I wrote them all down, and I stuck with it. I don't have anything else left in there. This is it. But a lot of what I wanted to say is about writing across Montana, which I did in my gubernatorial campaign, which was absolutely the experience of a lifetime. There's a lot of other things I wanted to talk about, but that is where the photograph came. And um, I think it's just one of the most interesting things I ever did with my life. Keep those wonderful opportunities out there for yourself. So here's a piece of that. My campaign horseback ride did not enthuse all my team members. The political landscape between Big Timber and Haver, where Mary is waiting for me, <laughs> is neither democratic nor well populated. In retrospect, I would not be surprised if a number of my hosts did not support me, although my rural vote was very pleasing. But that wasn't the point. It is important for politicians to learn that out and out political support is not the only measure of a good person and a valuable opinion. In any case, I felt a need to hear authentic voices from the heartland, and I succeeded. For the most part, this ride included two of us. My friend Emily Stonington, who laid out the map, did an advanced drive through and arranged the details of where we and the horses would stay. On several occasions, we were joined by joyous women riders, and we would whoop it up on the roadside or gallop across fields. We had three consecutive crews for each of the three weeks. They drove the pickup and horse trailer, generally roughing it with sleeping bags and tents, and were busy on the front line putting up posters, notifying small-town newspapers and radio stations, and preparing the way. Emily and I stayed in people's homes and benefited from their amazing generosity and curiosity. Although we were happy on sofas, some insisted on giving us their master bedrooms. To this day, I'm stunned that nothing went wrong other than my dear Jackson going lame for a day. Stop it, Mary. <laughs> he ended up on Mary's pasture and was a happy boy. Several noteworthy moments stand out particularly vividly. One was when Emily and I left the Blue Highways and rode cross country as we departed from Hugo Turek's ranch near Coffee Creek. He pointed out our route in a general direction and described where we would need to find gates. I attribute the success of this ride to Emily since a sense of direction is not one of my strong suits. Without even a compass, we rode across pastures, down bluffs into a drainage, and through cottonwoods lining a low-flowing creek. We rode through ravines, up some challenging bluffs on the other side, and eventually through a gate and onto a highway. I was dumbfounded that we made it. As we were closing the last gate, a pickup drove by, came to a screeching halt, backed up, and out jumped a, federal, fed, a fellow legislator from this district, Republican, of course. We had hugs all round and must have laughed the rest of the day at this mon marvelous Montana-type coincidence. We took a little time for special items of rural interest. In Harlington, we treated ourselves to a night in the beautiful Grace Hotel with its white crocheted curtains. In Lewistown, we listened to cowboy poetry. 
where the friendly owner of the Logo Inn insisted we park our horses on his motel lawn. We chatted with some delightful women and children at a Hutterite colony and watched the entire town of Fort Benton chase a youngster's 4-H steer as it left the fairgrounds hell-bent for the Missouri River. I remember feeling the devastation of a flattened grain field right after a hailstorm passed Square Butte and the camaraderie of a freezing cold community swimming hole near Hobson. Never an hour passed when I wasn't thinking, oh man, this is my extraordinary state and I can't believe my good fortune to be here. A favorite recollection is entering Loma. We thought a great photo op would be fording the Marias River as we entered town. But after terrifying ourselves, going horse belly deep in mud, we retreated to the bridge. I fell in love with Loma and dreamed of a second life in that community involving ranching, small town events, children, PTAs, and all the things my life had not been. My wonderful uncle, known as Snorin' Dave by the rest of the crew who were camping with him, was fueling the pickup, the pickup at Loma's gas station. He proudly watched us ride into town, fortunately across the bridge, and said to the owner, I bet you have never seen a woman riding across Montana running for governor. The owner looked us over coolly and replied, no, and one is enough. Imagine my nervousness to voluntarily follow Dorothy Bradley. Uh, Crow Fair. In the late summer of 1992, a couple of months prior to her gubernatorial general election, Dorothy joined friends at the Crow Fair, a beautiful annual celebration outside of Crow Agency close to the Little Bighorn Monument in southeast Montana. At this traditional celebration, each clan sets up its own family compound. The compound includes a number of teepees. There is a fully equipped open air central kitchen with chairs and benches for the extended family and visitors who will drift by. Each clan has its own long established spot and they're all connected by a long road looping around the camp. At the center, food and beverage vendors sell any and everything from traditional fry bread to Kool-Aid slushes. An arena is set up for giveaways, dancing, and drumming. As soon as one steps into this temporary village, one is transported into a unique indigenous Apsa'aluka world. She was very fortunate to be taken into the Pease clan, and Ben Pease was her extraordinary host. The clan had an extra teepee, since one family member had dropped out at the last minute. Unbelievably, Dorothy had her own beautiful lodge. Her most treasured memory is sitting in the evening with the clan in the kitchen complex as sunset morphed into night. The dust settled and the heat subsided. She doesn't remember eating and there certainly was no drinking of alcohol. Her memory was five or six hours of conversation. The stories would roll out. There would be lots of quiet chuckling and then it would become quiet. Someone would be reminded of something else and off they would go. It was hushed, it was companionable. It was warm-hearted, never loud, argumentative, impatient, or annoyed. Sometime around midnight, Dorothy retired to her teepee. The drums started about 2 a.m. The women were dancing, moving together in a gentle rolling wave. They were joined by some jingle dress dancers, a little more vigorous, moving out in their gorgeous full-length dresses beautifully beaded with hand-sewn, tiny, silvery teepees, gently, softly tinkling as they danced. 
Then the males burst into the arena, swirling around with enormous multicolored headdresses bristling with eagle feathers, dazzling as sage grouse da checking out the landscape. She laid in her teepee later that night, feeling the beat totally at peace, the beat pulsing into the earth for the rest of the night. Okay, now's your chance. They've read selections from the book, and I'm going to open it up for Q&A. Does anybody have something about a writing process, about riding horses, about Montana? Or do Dorothy or Ray have any further comments they want to make? If you want to start me on Big Dorothy, of course I do. <laughs> Who is an actual madam on Last Chance Gulch who actually had her institution there when I was a freshman. That's way back. That was 1971. And it was, I once, I thought this has got to be a phantom. I don't really believe this can be going on, that there is a big Dorothy on Last Chance Gulch. And I looked it up in the phone book, and there it was, Dorothy's Rooms. <laughs> but my most favorite story about Big Dorothy, I guess I would let you know that she, as you probably know, she was very appreciated in the community. She sent young people, she gave them college scholarships and did all kinds of really thoughtful, generous things. But when I, uh, my first time, oh, there's so many stories. When I first came to Helena, the chamber thought it was hilarious. And it had nothing to do with short skirts. I think I was a little better than that. But anyway, I can remember one of them coming up and saying, oh, this is great. Now we have a big Dorothy in both houses. <laughs> And then there was, the, of, there was, of course, the other time when I was chairing the committee of the whole, in the whole house chamber, terrified, not really being totally up on my Mason's rules and everything else. And some, one of my friends, of course, popped up and said, we're trying to think of what we should call you. I mean, Madam Mistress, Madam Dorothy, Madam Chairman, and I finally said, we'll just take it in the generic sense, and you can use whatever you'd like. But yeah, we had a whole lot of fun with that. And I'm just amazed. How, how is it you know anything about Madam Dorothy Baker, who is her own good person? Oh, I know. Yeah. Well, Jesus, Dorothy. I mean, I'm from Bozeman. We knew each other in Bozeman. And of course, it was all part of Ellen, I didn't, I didn't recognize you from way up here. I know. Oh, but thank you for bringing this story up. And I'm so glad to see you here, and thank you for coming. No, I had no... Of course, you knew Helena inside out. Yeah, yeah. Any Anything you'd like to add about her? Well, I just people to the school after my companion died in the middle, so... It's only a year. It's only a And I know your daughter, Sonia. Thank you for that. Sorry to be slow on the draw. Well, then, of course, there were the Dorothys of the legislature that Dorothy had. Yeah. So. Give me another question. Yes. Give Ray a question. Yes, keep it up. Let's go. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Yes. Sorry. Daphne has one. Do you want a mic? Dear Dear. Dear. Um, Dear. Can you tell us what prompted you to get so involved in politics at such a very young age? Because you were in your a whole bizarre set of circumstances. Yeah. Rich Rader, who helped me every step of the way and who had also worked for the legislature. 
You better write some of your own stories, Ellen. After I left college, I um, went to Germany to figure out what I was going to do next. And then was called back home because my mother was terminally ill with cancer. So I stayed with her and my father and then was again trying to figure out my life because there I was again in Bozeman. And with Bob Brown, with a bunch of others, put together, helped organize the first Earth Day in Bozeman in 1970. And at the end of that event, which was a stunning success, everybody was so ex so excited to participate and help save the planet. And I, I do hope we can rev that up again. But um, we had a party at the end of that gathering. And... I'm going to see him next week, but this wonderful dairy farmer from uh, Great Falls, Harry Mitchell, who is still living, close to 90, he was a real hero in the legislature, passing all kinds of environmental things and being concerned about water. And there was a fever going on then of all these things that were going on that were not so good. And he said, why don't you run for the legislature? You're the wrong age, wrong sex, and wrong party. And I actually did put that in the book because it's just such a famous phrase. Because I thought, oh, well, that's one way of putting it. Why not? And I only had one day to make the decision and went up to Helena and signed up. But, you know, the 70s were phenomenal in so many ways. The people were really coming to life. Uh, the environment was terribly at risk with development going on in eastern Montana. The Constitution was extraordinarily out of, uh, out of date. And very quickly in the early 70s came the Constitutional Convention. And I was there before and after and was able to participate in the implementation. How could you be so lucky with your timing? So I have a follow-up question. Have you figured out yet what you're going to do with, with your life? <laughs> <laughs> Just get on to the next day. <laughs> Hope I don't do something really foolish. <laughs> There's got to be other questions. Is anybody thinking about writing? I'm getting a lot of push from my family to write a lot of stuff, but I don't really have the energy or the great desire to start putting all these stories together from my side of the family. So, how do you get that? How do you start my Do you feel you've got some good stories? Oh, yes. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> oh, yes is a good answer. Um, do you type? Do you work on, do you do Word on computers? I find that's a really good place to start for me. And I just made a list of all the things I wanted to talk about, and it was pretty short. But that is a really good place to start. Um, are you a good editor? You can edit your own stuff. I was talking to you. Could you edit? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I think so. Yeah. I was an English major, but it's obviously... Ah, that's, that's good enough. <laughs> I, I'd say give it a try. Um, if you hate working at a keyboard, I like it. Although at one point in my life when I worked for a judge, I learned to dictate. But if you find one or the other and then try it out. You've got some good stories. You must want to get them off your shoulders. You must want to get them out there in print. It is so rewarding. It's so much fun. No. No, no. Do it. <laughs> I hope you do. You know, if you've got stories to tell, you're going to, feel, you're going to be a happier person to, to get it down. That's what I said. <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah. I'm going to give him advice as I would give my third grade. Go on to that. Okay, this isn't my advice that I would give my third grade students. Is just put it out there. Just write it down as fast as you can. And if you want to write in cursive, that's okay. Whatever. Or talk into a microphone or, you know, into your phone. Just get it down. Just... Put it out there. I, I say regurgitate it. Do not worry about, oh, should I do this word or should I do that word? 
forget that. Just get it down, and then you can go back and read it over and then fix it. But I just think there's something to that first impetus about just getting your thoughts on paper or your um, whatever it is you want to say. Pretend like you're talking to your granddaughter or your grandson, and you want to tell them this story. And, and I, I just found that that helped me so much when I was under a deadline for writing, um, just to do that. And then I could sleep on it and then go back to it. Oh, I love that. Does anyone want to build on that? Do I have to start calling on people? I'm not quite, I, I just drove over from Clyde Park. I'm not quite ready to go home. <laughs> yes, Toby. The other thing about writing about your life is um, is that it's really fun to talk to other people about your life. Uh, you know, you know. I tell my students who who want to write memoirs that don't assume that you're the best authority on your own life. Uh, you're only seeing it through these two eyes and you know, hearing it through these through these two ears. Go back and talk to other people who were there. If your parents are still alive, obviously interview them. Uh, you know, friends, business associates, anybody who was there, uh, you know, people who rode across Montana with you. Uh, you can get a, a, you can get a, a you know, more of a three-dimensional view of what's happening. And not only that, but but uh, remember or be informed about things that that either that you didn't know or or had forgotten. So that's a really fun way to to jumpstart the process. Also, is by talking to other people who were there, who shared your experience. Yeah, I love that. I think most of all, what you're saying is right about what stirs you. I mean, find that thing and then go with it. I did do some some stories about some other interesting characters, one of which I got into the Montana Quarterly because I thought his life was so extraordinary. And I just sat next to him and talked to him and then wrote it up. But, um, you know, we all go around here as we get older and older saying, oh, I should have written down my grandmother's story or my dad's story. What I'm telling you is write down your own story. You know, those can those will will drift away with time. But get your get your own good stories down because they're really worth it. Please, she's a writer. It's I have done editing for thirty years. This experience was a gift. Dorothy is an excellent writer. And uh, I had the good fortune with her of knowing her since the early 80s and being good friends with her so that I could perform that service that the gentleman in the back mentioned. Because I could say, well, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that that is exactly the right word. What I remember was dot da 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 and she, oh, and she'd go off. And but find a write, finding a writing partner is a really good idea. Finding someone who can write as well as Dorothy does is a gift. Dorothy, I want to turn my attention back to you. Would you reflect a little bit on your life in public service and the kind of the pluses or advantages um, in doing that and also some of the negatives? I need a week's advance on that one to <laughs> think about it. I'm not very spontaneous. I like to mull. Thanks, Roger. I think the best I would say at this point is that I have loved my life in public service. It's never one I would have imagined from the time I was in college thinking about being an anthropologist and going to Africa. And then it came along and dropped itself. And 
I don't know what to say except that I've always felt, and I do to this day at 75, I think that uh, the biggest gift in life is to be able to make a contribution. And public service is one of the ways that you can do that. Um, I think about what we did back in the 70s with the Constitution, with the environmental policy, the visionary people, the opportunity of everybody to work together. And then it kind of drifted away and everything became more difficult. And all I want to do right now with my life is go out and tell them your constitution is in peril. The planet is at the edge of fraying. The statutes that we worked so hard on to protect our beloved Montana are being thrown away right and left. And it's time for everybody else to find this opportunity we still have in Montana to be involved. We're not, we're not an overcrowded, overpopulated place. We can still go next door, knock on doors, run for the city commission, you know, do all of these things. And I feel immensely lucky to have done that. And I, I just so desperately want more people to be engaged, which I don't know if I have seen yet, but maybe it's coming. I don't have any downsides, you know, I could have led a thousand other lives and I feel lucky to have led the one that I did. What about you? Would you say something about that, Roger, who has spirited institutions of higher education and, uh, no, you won't. Roger, I want you to write your book. <laughs> Um, I, I did want the attention to be on Dorothy. Uh, you were talking about writing, and there is there is another device that um, is available called StoryWorth. Are any of you familiar with the StoryWorth program? It's it's um, it's a it's a company that um, literally is available online, and our nephew signed Mary and I up. And every week you get a question from StoryWorth that you can answer. Or if you don't like that question, I don't like most of them. So I, uh, you can go in and pull out other questions or you can make up your own. Um, and, it, and at the end of 52 weeks, if you can last that long, because it is kind of exhausting, they publish a book about you, Roger Barber's stories, Mary Van Buskirk's stories, Dorothy Bradley's stories. And they vary from week to week. I mean, I've had such things as, what was your best job? Who was your best boss? Um, <laughs> um, um, Sheila Stearns, by the way. Um, yes. Um, but also, they can be frivolous things, like, did you ever... Did you ever fight with your parents about haircuts or clothes? I never did, except when I was in college. Um, after my freshman year in college, I came back with bleached hair on a dare, and in my sophomore year, I came back with a bald head um, because I, well, never mind. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, it's a wonderful device that, that literally kind of focus, forces you to think about different things in your life and answer the question. And you get a book at the end. It's called... It's called StoryWorth. Um, and also, by the way, each week they, you can designate people to get your story, which I find a little intimidating because I might want to talk about them. So I'd, I'd rather they read it in book form. Anyway, that's another, that's another way to do it. And think, think, did you like it? Did I like, do I like StoryWorth? Yes. I love every week writing my story, yeah, depending on the question. Yeah. Mary's... Mary, Mary's doing it too. I want to hear about story worth Mary. Mary calls it homework. Are you doing it though, Mary? Are you? Oh, sounds kind of interesting. I felt by sitting in the back row, I, I wouldn't get called on. <laughs> so I'm going to sit here until um, the, the teacher tells me. <laughs> Hi, Dorothy. You were busy. I wanted to hug you. Of course, I feel like if you hug Dorothy, that she might, she's so frail. That she, 
But anyway, it's great to see you. I know you're tough as hell, but uh, it's great to see you. Anyway, I'm just delighted to be here. And to uh, Ray, of course, gave several of us your book during the, gosh, spring, winter, a while back. When, when you gave us, first gave us the book and... I've treasured, I've given away two copies, so now I, today I had to buy a third one, so you have to sign it this time. Anyway, <laughs> right, anyway, it's great to see you. Staying an extra night in Helena to make sure Missoula's appropriations were, U of M's appropriations were represented. People can't hear you, so. I want her to use it. Well, Um, I can make it very okay, brief. No. Okay. It was about 89? 91. 91? 91 session. And very briefly, I was just, uh, I was coming to the end of um, treatment for a pretty severe breast cancer and had uh, started radiation. I'd finished chemo and you, on radiation you have to be there every day. Well, that darn legislature, I thought my timing was good, but then they, um, they didn't finish on time, kind of, and then the state of Montana employees went out on strike. So it was all kind of a, a, at sixes and sevens, but I needed to get home every night for my, I had young kids and going into that weekend, uh, Hal had something, so I thought, I, oh, I let my, someone was giving me a ride every day of radiation so that I could do this. And then, and by the way, you know, I'd lost all my hair with chemo, so I was wearing a wig. And, um, you know, Wendy, Hell and I had to hold it on. Well, I, I didn't have a car because I let my ride go home because I, and all of a sudden I needed to get home and get back the next morning. So I thought, how am I going to do this? Borrowed my brother-in-law's car. I should have known. He never takes care of it. Mustang. A Mustang. An orange Mustang. And it dies just on its way up the pass. I'm out there in the wind holding my wig on. You know, you had to wear a dress all the time then. And just, it was flying. And, you know, it was just terrible. Found a ride. Hitchhiked back into town. Left the car. Caught a bus at the bus depot. It was heading back to Missoula. Caught but when you were waiting in the bus station... <laughs> You had 50 cents and had to decide if yeah. you're going to newspaper to fend off the boredom or a cup of coffee to keep you awake. Well, that was a detail you and I'd forgotten. That's why you need people to help. I remember it now. It was just uh, kind of miserable. But but the a major appropriations meeting was the next morning, you know, that affected our employees at the university. I needed to get back. So anyway, Dorothy, thank you for remembering that. I'd almost forgotten it. Every detail. And she was back. And when she told me that story, I burst into tears. I said, Sheila, I can't believe it. Any of us would have driven you there. Couldn't you have given us a call? But no, on the bus she went. Anyway, Sheila, you have quite a few stories. Um, Ray was prompting me to say something about sharing my book with Mark Roscoe, which I did. And when I thought about it, he'd been so gracious about me lately, I thought, Ray and I quickly went back and amended a few of the words in, this, in the sales tax story. And I thought, I don't want this to sound the least bit, bit toxic. I just want to relay the story of the sales tax debate. So I did send him the book. And then I waited. And I didn't get anything back. And I didn't get anything back. And I had his telephone number. I finally called him and said, I am feeling so worried. Did I offend you? Are you okay? He said, oh my gosh, I'd forgotten about that. He said, I read it all in one sitting, then I gave it to Teresa, and then it disappeared because she gave it to all her kids. <laughs> and, you know, since then, this is just so interesting. Here it is 30 years after that. We have become really good friends. We're going everywhere in eastern Montana to tout Gary Buchanan and against Rosendale. And it's just one of the, I feel like it's just one of the best things I've done. I, I, I really do. I, I'm now challenging everybody to go out and find someone they once had a political disagreement with and to join hands and go forward together because nothing's going to get us through all this unless we do that. Okay. You'll be happy to know that my grandson, Isaac, 
in Helena, has worked for the Democratic Party as a high schooler for two years. So anyway, he had to leave now because he's starting at Stanford. <laughs> His father is working on the redistricting committee. Yeah. So I've got some going. You've always had a lot going. Yeah. Are we about there? We're there. Thank you so much. It doesn't matter the size, it's what's inside that counts. And I have little small books that I've collected that they've made. Like, like, there's several of the Winnie the Pooh stories that are made into little miniature things, really pocket size. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to write, and please don't write the thousand page book. You know, 69 pages is a, is a great way to start talking about Montana and Montana stories. So I like how you've encouraged people, and my brothers are both doing story worth. And I always get the call for the pictures. Do you have photographs from when we camped and went here and there and the every? So I can't wait to see if they really will send us all a copy. We'll see. <laughs> all right, thank you all. <laughs>